The next item of business is a debate on motion 14520 in the name of Jamie Green on concern over the state of Scotland's ferry service. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Jamie Green to speak to move the motion. Mr Green, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by the outset of this debate by thanking those on the ground who care so passionately about delivering Scotland's ferry services, those working on board our vessels, in our ports and harbours, and those welding the sheets of our future fleet. But I do so in the knowledge that they are working in a difficult climate, under contracts largely outside of their control, on vessels they often did not choose or design, and in a climate where their repeated calls for adequate investment is going unnoticed and ignored. Our criticisms today will reflect the strength of feeling on this matter right across Scotland. Our criticism is focused squarely at the door of the government, which after a decade in office has yet to deliver a sustainable, fit-for-purpose fleet and network of ferries in Scotland. A government that is presiding over an ageing fleet of vessels, with no real standardisation between vessel and port, with little to no resilience within that fleet, and which is dogmatic in its pursuit of directly awarding contracts, and which has, uh, if it's very brief, got a lot to get through. Minister. It's, it is now, thank it you. Is. Uh, if, if the member is, is making his, his assertions about the role of the Scottish Government, will he not recognise that over the last decade now, we have faced uh, increasing austerity, certainly since 2010. And it's, it's not a minor matter. The, the member might ignore this, but there's been £1.9 billion real terms cut in the Scottish Government's budget in 2019 20 as a result of your government. Mr. Green, don't fret. I will give you your time back, but you mustn't get up and stand while another member is speaking. Anxious though you are, Mr. Green. Thank you so much, Presiding Officer. My goodness, uh, the Minister has an absolute cheek to stand up and tell this chamber that it's somebody else's fault that the ferry services in Scotland are not up to scratch. It's always somebody else's fault, Minister. But I would advise you to listen to what, not just what we have to say, but members right across this chamber from every part of Scotland. Listen to us and listen to the people out there who have to rely on those services. We brought forward this debate because of those voices. Those voices right across Scotland, not experts in the marine industry, but the people to who the ferry services matter the most. Like the farmer who contacted me from Arran, who cannot get his livestock to the market on the mainland. Why? Because of a lack of commercial space on the vessel. Like the tourists I met, sitting in a queue outside my office in Largs, come down from Glasgow for the day to take his family to Millport for a day trip, but spent three hours, three hours queuing to get a, a, a seat on a vessel that takes eight minutes to cross to Cumbria. Or even worse, like Monty Phillips, a carer who was forced to sleep in a grit bin overnight because the last ferry to Dunoon was cancelled and the terminal staff would not even let her sleep in the waiting room. Outrageous, shocking stories of people being let down. The fact is that since the SNP came to power, there have been over 70,000 ferry delays or cancellations across Scotland. That's 177 sailings a week in Scotland being disrupted. And it's quite timely that today's debate comes as the Rural Economy and Connectivity Com Committee released a letter to the Transport Secretary, who I notice is absent from today's debate, summarising its findings, summarising its findings on ferry funding as part of budget scrutiny. This report Minister, it makes for some very difficult reading. I advise you to read it very, very carefully. And perhaps if you had read it, you may have submitted a more realistic and self-aware amendment to the one you submitted today. The REC committee was told that ferry services and its infrastructure have suffered from a lengthy, lengthy period of underinvestment. In its evidence to the committee, CalMax Managing Director described the 2018 summer uh, disruption as the worst in eight years. He told the committee that in terms of backup vessels, uh, CalMac has no spare assets, no spare fleet, and its staff are working at their absolute capacity just to maintain the status quo. If a single vessel is out of service, it disrupts the entire network for weeks at a time, as was the case when the NV Klansman was out of service. And to be fair to Mr. Drummond, it's not CalMac's fault. They're working with the contracts and the fleet they have available to them. The committee took 
uh, a number of uh, evidence sessions from a wide range of stakeholders. And these are the, some of the concerns that they raised. The lack of vessel capacity for vehicles. Investment not matching increased growth from tourism. Insufficient integration with mainland transport. A focus on procuring larger, more expensive vessels, which limits their ability to move vessels between one port and another, or to between one service and another. And I know there are a wide range of views in this parliament on who should or shouldn't operate our ferries. But when the government did run a tender for CHIFs, the process was complex and flexible, expensive, and actually discouraged innovative bids. The committee noted that investment in port infrastructure and vessels quite simply is not meeting demand. CMAL's chief executive told the REC committee that the annual investment he thought needed was £30 million per year on vessels and £20 million per year on harbours. It has been receiving just half of that. So it's no huge surprise to anyone that there is so, that's so much disruption on our fleets. But presenting also there's a wider problem here. Last year's report on ferries by Audit Scotland warned that this long-term lack of investment and vision, along with skyrocketing subsidies and limited finances, could be detrimental to the long-term viability of Scotland's ferries. In their words, they said, there is no Scotland-wide long-term strategy. Transport Scotland will find it challenging to continue to provide ferry services that meets the needs of users within its allocated budget. But this isn't the future. I would argue that this is already the case. So in that context, I'm pleased to agree with Labour's amendment today. On these benches, we share their aspiration for a government which produces a 30-year plan for both shipbuilding and ferry replacement. Uh, it's a sensible addition to the debate, and I would ask other members to support it as well. The industry has been saying this for years. Even as far back as 2011, uh, the Scottish Government acknowledged itself it said, we are faced with significant and growing increases uh, in both resource and capital costs to maintain existing ferry services. It is clear that we are not able to deliver all of our improvements to ferry services. And since the introduction of RET, the reality is that demand has simply outstripped supply. And who is suffering the most in all of this? It is our island communities. The government's amendment today simply does one thing. It deletes my motion. It says, and it notes, that people are concerned and they're frustrated. Presiding officer, today's award for the biggest understatement goes to Paul Wheelhouse. We called for this debate today because enough simply is enough. For too long, the Scottish Government has ignored repeated warnings from the industry. The public are sick and tired of the disruption, of the delays and of the cancellations. They were promised new vessels they haven't arrived. They asked for one type of vessel and they were delivered another. They were promised that their needs would be put first and instead they're queuing for hours on end to get a ferry home. I would urge all members in the chamber today to listen to the many stories and anecdotes you will hear from the length and breadth of Scotland. And rather than pretend that the status quo is acceptable as the government wants you to do, stand up and stick up for your island communities because that's what we will do. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I call Paul Wheelhouse to speak and move Amendment 14520.4. Minister, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises our ferry services must strive to match the aspirations of the communities that they serve, providing lifeline services and opportunities for economic growth. Indeed, our amendment makes reference to lifeline services, something missing from Mr Green's motion. In the round, our ferry services perform well. To date, this government has invested over £1.4 billion in ferry services across Scotland, and performance for the year to date under our three public sector contract sits at above 95%. However, I, I want to also take this opportunity uh, to commend the work of ferry operators, crew and staff in maintaining high levels of performance, often in quite challenging circumstances we all recognise, and we should not lose sight of that success, uh, but we cannot be complacent. And I do, I do recognise that Mr Green has, has also uh, welcomed the contribution of CalMAC staff, uh, but that didn't feature in his motion. So the government amendment does make that point clear, and so members who are considering whether to vote for the government's amendment can register their support uh, uh, for, for the staff of CalMAC who are providing a, a key lifeline service. But given the financial pressures that we continue to face, uh, 
It is important that we have an honest conversation about how we prioritise investment in our ferry services to target resources as effectively as possible. Those pressures do uh, persist, uh, and in light of this uh, week's UK government budget, which sees a real terms cut of 1.9 billion, just to repeat that point, against the 2010-11 budget, and the Conservative members may shake their heads, but it is a fact. It is a fact. I, I, will, I will give way on that point to Mr Fraser. I know he's, he's interested in these matters. I'm, I'm Order Fraser. The Minister. Order Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. He just said twice to the Chamber something that is manifestly untrue. He has stated twice that the Scottish Government's budget has been reduced by £1.9 million since 2010. Can I suggest he reads the Fraser of Allender Institute analysis, which shows that the Scottish Government's total budget, resource Dell, capital, um, financial transactions and AME is in total higher than it was in real terms than 2010. Will he now accept he has misled the Chamber? Uh, that was a long intervention. Minister, that was a long intervention. I'll give you your time back. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Absolutely not. I do not agree with Mr Fraser's assessment. And he is, with, with, respect, with respect to Mr Fraser, referring to financial transactions funding as if those funds can be deployed to support resource budgets for ferry services is misleading this Chamber. So Mr Fraser ought to consider his own remarks there. The resource budget has been reduced by £1.9 billion relative to the 2010-11 budget. And let us not also forget, and this is a point that presumably Mr Fraser will also dispute, that Mr Green's own party's propo tax proposals for the current year would have reduced Scotland's resource budget by a further £500 million relative to our own tax proposals. So Mr Green has accused me of cheek. Uh, can I, in return, uh, while being diplomatic and, and being polite about it, accuse Mr Green of uh, extensive brass neck in his approach to the resourcing of our ferry services? I am committed to engaging with all of our stakeholders I have been since assuming responsibility for Ferries Brief this summer to ensure their views are understood and we have those discussions. Indeed, it would be of interest, maybe uh, Mr Green can respond later, to let me know how many occasions the Conservative Party have asked for additional funding in budget rounds uh, from the Scottish Government since, uh, since uh, our, our, our taking office in 2007. Presiding officer, I would like to briefly reflect on our activity to date. We published our ferries plan in 2012. That was an ambitious long-term strategy for investment in ferries. And despite the Tories' age of austerity, we have invested over £1.4 billion in supporting lifeline ferry services. I'm short of time, Mr Scott, but I'll try and come in if I can later um, across, the, uh, across the network. That support has delivered the introduction of new routes, service enhancements and strengthened timetables, and additional sailings provided in response to increasing demand. We're delivering, but it will take time to deliver in full. Eight new ferries have been added to the CalMac fleet since 2007. A further two new vessels have been commissioned. This represents a total investment of £215 million in new vessels, and we have also recently committed to provide a further vessel to serve the Isley route. Uh, not insignificantly, five of the last six orders for those new vessels have been awarded to Scottish Yards. We see the contribution that ferries make to our supply chain and to securing growth in our maritime economy. All five of those Scottish-built vessels deploy hybrid and dual fuel technologies to reduce the damaging effect of greenhouse gas emissions, and we recognise the important contribution that ferries can make to our overarching strategy to reduce emissions. Our programme of harbour investment includes £62 million in uh, the Clyde and Hebrides network over the last five years. This ensures that ports remain safe and are fit for purpose. And when funding allows, we invest in enhancements which enable a wider range of vessels to access the harbour, adding resilience and flexibility and providing modern and accessible facilities for passengers. More recently, in response to the impact of disruption to customers, which we do recognise, we have introduced a 3.5 million resilience fund to support CalMac and its obligation to maintain vessels on the Clyde and Hebrides network. Now, going forward, we have, achieved, uh, we have achieved much, but we must continue to look uh, forward and to build on our investment to date. Transport Scotland is revisiting the ferries plan as part of the Strategic Transport Projects Review. We will also revisit the vessel replacement and deployment plan to ensure that it continues to reflect current circumstances and demands and make, anticipate future demands. And in particular, this will have to reflect a huge success of our RET and the impact on passenger demand on some routes. We're working close consultation with key part business partners and community stakeholders. And uh, in terms of the, uh, the work ahead, we will engage with the trade unions to reflect the operational impact on, of any proposals on uh, staff and crew. These are quite properly 
long-term measures given the scale of investment. If I may, Presiding Officer, bring in Mr Scott as I... No, uh, well, you're really closing, so if you do, you're... you're I thought I had additional time, Presiding Officer. You but have, but you only had six minutes because you're getting just slightly okay. over that. These are quite properly long... Apologies to Mr Scott. These are quite properly long-term issues. Given the scale of investment, it's important we take an informed, strategic and balanced approach. I've been listening care carefully to Island Communities, Presiding Officer, since assuming responsibility for ferry services, and I want to put on record that I do understand the very real challenges that are faced as a consequence of service disruptions, particularly at the level experienced this summer. I'm determined we must get this right. In addition to close, closely monitoring operational performance, we're developing an action plan with our ferry operators, and this will ensure that appropriate measures are in place to improve the customer experience when things do go wrong. We'll continue to challenge operators to communicate proactively with customers when there are delays. And they must, with our support, ensure that appropriate measures are in place to ensure that lifeline, lifeline services are not compromised. I look for support across the, from across the Chamber to developing the action plan and in supporting my amendment, the Chamber can ensure that this commitment is recorded please, and I will be held to account for any delays in its implementation. I move your amendment, Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, I thank you for your forbearance. I uh, will move the amendment in my name and ask members to support thank it. Thank you. I now call Colin Smith to speak to move amendment 14520.3. Five minutes, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It's no exaggeration to, to say Scotland's ferry mm -hmm. network provides a lifeline for communities. In evidence to the Rural Economy Committee, Western Isles Council described them as central to the sustainability and well-being of the island communities. Argel and Butte said they were the very means to survive and prosper. So the summer of discontent we've seen on Scotland's ferries caused by a lack of capacity and resilience have wreaked havoc for our island communities. Poor planning and investment by the Scottish Government that is not meeting growing demand means our ferry network is not fit for purpose, despite at times the quite heroic efforts of staff to keep those ferries going. But more than half of Seamill's fleet is over 20 years old, over a quarter is more than 30 years old. That ageing fleet has meant more breakdowns and higher maintenance costs. In CalMAC's submission to the, the Rural Economy Committee, they stated that on the Clyde and Hebrides route between 2012 and 2017, the number of cars carried has grown by 37% to 1.43 million per year, and passenger numbers have risen by 17% to 5.2 million per year. Now, the introduction of road equivalent tariff fares on some routes has resulted in those drastic increases in usage and created serious capacity issues, most notably on the Stornoway to Ullapool route, where local residents in Lewis and, and Harris have often simply been unable to book ferries to the mainland. Presiding officer, we all welcome the introduction of RET fares, and I hope the Scottish Government will make good on their overdue pledge to introduce them on the Northern Isles route. But it must be accompanied by the necessary investment and capacity to meet that growing demand. Transport Scotland may have calculated and funded the cost of lost ticket revenue caused by RET, but they have not properly assessed the impact of increased usage on capacity and the current ferries plan falls short as a result. When that plan is revisited, it needs to have a commitment in the forthcoming budget to increase capacity to meet growing demand. Beyond this plan, yeah, I'll give away. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Does he think that there is scope for varying ferries so that, uh, fares so that perhaps the, uh, there could be a slightly higher fare at peak times to try and even out the demand? Colin Smith. I don't think that would go down particularly well for those people looking uh, at the prospect of higher fares, but the issue is that RET, which is welcome, has increased demand and we need to increase capacity to meet that demand to follow that policy through. Now, beyond revisiting the ferries plan, there are shortcomings in how the government also procures investment in ferry services. The poor track record is clear in the decision to replace the MV Isle of Lewis with one large ship rather than two Ropax vessels as recommended by the STAG assessment and supported by the local community. This not only requires significant adjustments to the ports, but also weaken resilience on the route by relying on a single ship. The approach to ferry services has to be better thought through and needs greater forward planning. As the motion notes, Audit Scotland recently highlighted the need for a new long-term strategy for ferries to take into account the many proposed developments to services and assets. In fact, a decade ago, the Transport and Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee called on the Scottish Government to produce a national ferry strategy detailing long-term plans for routes, ferry replacement, refurbishment and port infrastructure accompanied by an implementation and delivery plan with a clear programme of funding. Ten years later, the government have not delivered this, causing uncertainty for those providing services and the communities they rely on. We need this long-term ferry strategy more than ever, but it also has to be accompanied by a national shipbuilding strategy. Shipbuilding and the jobs it delivers remain important 
to the Scottish economy. A national shipbuilding strategy setting out a 30-year programme of work would help create jobs, develop and retain skills and expertise in Scotland's shipyards, encourage investment and improve the efficiency with which yards can produce ferries, creating that steady drumbeat of consistent work yards need. We also need to look again at the tendering process for shipbuilding contracts with failings exposed by the current delays in the delivery of the two new hybrid ferries. The flawed procurement process resulted in the design, it seems, that insurers were simply unwilling to underwrite, resulting in significant changes to that design. Despite that and the impact these delays have had on communities, there has been a slowness of government to intervene to bring all sides together to find a way forward. Uh, if I have time, but... I've... Not really. Okay. The government doesn't seem overall to recognise that ferry services, like all public transport, is a vital public service. And this is summed up by the ambivalence towards public ownership through the failure to take the Northern Ireland's contract in-house on a permanent basis. To add insult to injury, the decision by the government to charter MV Arrow from sea truck to meet growing freight demand on the route means staff being paid less than the national minimum wage. This needs to be tackled in future contracts. That means setting out unequivocal requirements for the paying conditions of all staff and ideally tending for more than two chartered freight vessels to, to avoid the situation arising in the first instance. This would also facilitate capacity increases and seasonal changes in demand. The contract must also include a clawback provision to ensure that surplus profits are returned to the public purse and protect the jobs and conditions of all existing staff. President officer, in conclusion, it's clear that across our ferry network we are seeing problems that could have been avoided with better planning and more strategic investment. The Scottish Government must take action to improve not only how ferries are run by bringing lifeline services into public Public hands, but how investment projects are planned, procured and managed by creating a long-term strategy for ferries and a national shipbuilding plan to support it. I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call John Finney to follow by Mike Rumbles. Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, the Scottish Green Party will be supporting the Conservative uh, motion tonight. Um, it's very difficult to take issue with it, and uh, I always try and take issue with everything the Conservative Party say, but they narrate a number of facts significant delays, disruptions, cancellations, no resilience in the network, the lack of additional vessels, and uh, a call for a long-term ferry strategy. That said, there's also a lack of self-awareness, certainly if there's a denial about the impact that the settlement has, and I'm not sure whether at various points I've heard complaints about RET, which is a success and has to be addressed some of the aspects. But I think we, we heard where the Conservatives really come from when they uh, stepped into the area. Excuse me, Mr. Finney, could you pull your microphone over yes, towards you? Uh, where the Conservatives okay. really come from, we, we heard uh, uh, references to tendering. And I certainly would align myself with the comments of, of Colin Smith there and the lost opportunity for the Scottish Government regarding the Northern Isles route, because I think you send a very clear direction of travel and your philosophy when you get opportunities like that. And, and I have to say that that's a missed opportunity. We will be supporting the, the Scottish Labour Party uh, uh, amendment tonight. Because, I, I, again, it, it narrates things that are very important about uh, an implementation and delivery plan and a 30-year programme of work. So that's important when seen in the context of the, the, um, the, the lifeline, uh, the, the, the duration that a, a ferry can survive. Um, I, I, I want to also thank the, the staff for their hard work because there's no doubt that the drip feed of, of negative comment that comes out does have an impact. And uh, I think we need to understand that... Uh, Increased funding is important. Uh, that's indeed, the, the amendment, which wasn't called, um, uh, selected, um, talks about increased funding being essential. And I'm very happy to explain where we would provide some of that funding from. We wouldn't be spending six billion on two roads. We wouldn't have spent three quarters of a billion um, a, a for the M8 or the Aberdeen West Peripheral Route. So I think it's important that people understand where the funding comes from. And in relation to that, clearly, as regards the um, replacement vessel in the Ullapool Lewis route, it certainly doesn't serve Lewis or Lewis, it certainly served Lloyds, the bank, who have benefited very, very well indeed from it. And indeed, the deal is going to cost taxpayers £67 billion by 2022, at which point the bankers will still own uh, the vessel. So, uh, and there will be a requirement to negotiate a, a new lease. So elsewhere, when we read about... Um, looking at funding models, that's certainly not a model that we would want to see replicated. Also, you know, lest anyone, uh, I think the present government have a number of questions to answer regarding where they are, but uh, Jamie Green alluded to the, the report from the Rural Economy Committee that went off this morning, and 
it, it's, it's significant to note the Highlands and Islands Transport pa Partnership noted that there were no new major vessels entered the service between 2001 and 2011. Now, that has a significant impact when you're looking at the lifespan of, of uh, vessels. So, uh, I, I, I think um, it's a collective responsibility to try and resolve this situation. Because I think if some of the difficulties had occurred with our road network that have occurred on our ferry network, then we'd be having a lot uh, higher profile given to this. So I welcome the fact that we are debating this issue. What I don't welcome is the fact that I read about uh, CMAL desc describing things as commercial and confidence uh, and terms like that. This is public money. I want to see a ferry service, a and I hope the Conservative benches keep nodding when I say a, 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 a ferry service run exclusively in the public interest, not for profit as we would see elsewhere, uh, the nodding stopped. Um, so I, I think the reality is that um, we need to make sure that we have a coherent plan and coherent funding method. Thank you. Mike Rumbles, no more than four minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, first of all, I want to thank Jamie Green for using this limited opposition time to debate, to debate this very important issue. And it's a very current issue in that the Rural Economy Committee has written to the Transport Secretary just two hours ago as part of our pre-budget scrutiny. And as a fellow member of the Rural Economy Committee, Jamie Green will be aware of the troubling evidence presented to members by operators and island communities, highlighting potential long-term problems for our ferry services just over the horizon. And I want to refer, and it's on the website of the committee, so members can see it for themselves, the first bullet point, the first recommendation in the letter delivered to the Transport Secretary uh, just two hours ago, that the committee called, and the minister may not have seen it, uh, so I'll, you, ha you have, good. Called, the first bullet point calls on the Scottish Government to respond to criticisms of the lack of resilience in the fleet and to the evidence, the evidence that Calmal has received less than half the amount of funding required over the past 10 years. And that's the result of the committee's investigation. Seamal, uh, don't I say Calmac? The, the effects of transport delays can be damaging for local economies and alarming for travellers. Significant delays to lifeline ferry services can severely impact upon island communities, and the damaging effects of delays are often multiplied as repairs take place over weeks and months. In the worst cases, livestock and fresh produce are turned away at ferry terminals, essential supplies and service vehicles are held up, and vital income from tourism is lost. Of course, delays are far less likely to be a problem if ferry operators have the resilience, have the flexibility, and have the capacity to move passengers onto other available services and vessels. This year, the Scottish Government welcomed the principles of fair funding for local ferry services for the Northern Islands, uh, Isles in Orkney and Shetland, as set out by my Scottish Liberal Democrat colleagues from Orkney and Shetland. By definition, the Scottish Government has accepted the responsibility to support vital ferry links for our island communities and help operators fund the snowballing cost of planned and unplanned maintenance. Deputy Presiding Officers, repairs at sea can only get us so far and there's certainly no quick fix for our ageing ferry fleet. This summer, CalMac reported that the risk of breakdown is now significant for many of their vessels. And I quote, with nearly half of ferries already beyond their 25-year life ex expectancy and having been used intensively during those years of service, the risk of mechanical failures and breakdown is significant. It also takes longer to get older boats back into service when things do go wrong. Deputy Presiding Officer, I strongly agree with the motion and with Colin Smith's amendment. In fact, I believe they do not go far enough. We urgently need a long-term plan for our ferry services in Scotland, a programme of investment that will provide transport security for island communities for decades to come. The Scottish Government must set out clear targets for improvement and most, most importantly work towards those targets must begin immediately. The Northern Isles Lifeline Ferry Services are in a tendering process now, for example. The Government must ensure that the future freight export needs of the islands are built into that contract specification. Industry has given the information they need, the Minister needs to do it. Will the Minister, in his summing up, ensure that happens? The current level of government engagement, past and present, in our lifeline ferry services hasn't been good enough and we're in danger of letting a bad situation get worse. 
we will be voting in favor of the conservative motion and the Labour amendment, but what we can't accept, though, is in the words of the amendment of the government, which seems to us to be somewhat complacent. We now move to the open debate. Very tight for time, so absolutely no more than four minutes for open speeches. Jamie Halcrow Johnson, followed by Keith Brown. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. As an Orcadian and someone with farming interests in Orkney, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important subject today. Around Scotland, we are seeing a range of problems facing those who rely on our ferry services, and these ferry routes are often an essential link to our island communities, where there are a few, if any, alternatives for travel or for freight. For those seeking access to public services to operate their businesses, or simply to travel for work or leisure, they are a lifeline. So it's unfortunate that there's such strong evidence of a lack of strategic direction in the Scottish Government's provision of, provision of support to ferries across the country. Since Audit Scotland drew attention to this issue in 2017, there's been little in the way of change. What we are left with is a disjointed and fundamentally unfair patchwork of provision, funding and investment, where island communities each receive very different levels of service. My own experiences are obviously with the Northern Isles, which are currently operated by Serco Northlink. And it's welcome that the Scottish Government is proceeding with the retendering of the Northern Isles ferry contract, following the announcement that the contract uh, notice has been published at the end of September. The contract will run for a period of eight years, setting the shape of the future service in the Northern Isles into, late, into the late 2020s. And it is only right that the Scottish Government is ambitious about the future of this service. And while I know that colleagues in the Labour uh, and the Green Benches will disagree, I only hope that the tendering process will also bring an end to the SNP's preoccupation with the public sector operator for the Northern Isles routes. The Islands Act was intended to support a new approach to Scotland's island communities, recognising local needs and local opinion. Yet it's striking to me that the Scottish Government did not recognise earlier that there is no groundswell of support in the Northern Isles for getting rid of tendering. We should see the, tendering, the new tendering process as an opportunity an opportunity to set in motion the changes that are vital to keep the service operating successfully. This includes taking a view on the long-standing complaints about accommodation and facilities available for passengers on the service. It means recognising the needs of business in moving freight, and it means ensuring that the service is able to adapt to the changing needs of islands in years to come. It must also ensure that when our ferries are in for refitting, their replacements meet the needs of local people and local businesses. And that has not been the case recently, where the stand-in for the MV Amnavo was a freight boat with limited passenger facilities, and which was entirely unsuitable for disabled passengers. Now, John Mason may be suggesting that uh, fares could go up at peak times for some of the routes uh, across Scotland. Um, I think one of the issues that looms over these discussions is that the SNP's manifesto commitment to introduce lower fares for the Northern Isles. This was fought for by island representatives, and it was promised by the SNP election after election. But this summer, the Scottish Government's own deadline came and went. In Shetland, the promise has been only part delivered. In Orkney, fare reductions have been kicked into the long grass. I'm not going to have time to, Minister, I'm afraid. The, the Scottish Government has tried to shift the blame onto private operators. But the need for these discussions was well known in advance. The Government has had ample time to discuss proposals with all stakeholders. And yet a mess was left behind when they were only commenced at a late stage in this process. And we must remember that these commitments were not simply a gift from ministers. They were a result of lengthy campaigning for a level of equality with the support offered to other islands. Yep. And they reflect the needs created by islands' geography. This unfortunately followed the ugly stramash around fair funding for the internal ferries, where ministers could not bring themselves in this chamber to repeat their own party pledges. It was only after the voices from community, from the islands and councillors, and from MSPs across the parties could no longer be ignored that a one-year deal was worked out. Mr. Today, Hacker however, the islands have still no certainty over the future funding of their internal ferries. What they need from the Scottish Government is to meet their own commitments to provide a settlement with a clear indication that it will be a regular rather than simply a one-off win with a fight every new year. Presiding officer, in Orkney and Shetland, the security of our ferry services has been hard won by, uh, by local communities uh, from what often appears an indifferent Scottish Government in Edinburgh. Our island communities, like so many others dependent on ferry services, deserve better. Keith Brown, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. There's no question that disruption and delays for local communities is causing frustration, especially where these are lifeline services. And I'm sure that both uh, Kenneth Gibson and Alistair Allen, who will speak for their communities, will highlight those uh, facts as well.
There's also no question that vessel procurement is a long-standing and continuing issue in terms of uh, vessel uh, procurement for the Scottish Government. And I would urge the Scottish Government to cast its net wide and to think as imaginatively as possible in order to help CalMAT procure the additional vessels which are required, not least for the resilience which has been mentioned. It is an extremely difficult market, as anybody that's been involved in it will know. But I think that just means we have to redouble our efforts in order to secure that additional uh, capacity. However, there is nothing in the Conservative uh, motion which helps that. There is nothing about investment. There is no figures. There is no commitment to anything at all. Pretty much standard fare for the Conservative Party. There is a complete lack of self-awareness as well. And what does surprise me somewhat is the Labour Party and the Green Party willing to ally themselves when they themselves are explicitly acknowledged that the real agenda of the Conservative Party is to further privatise uh, the ferry network. Now, Better Together, of course, told us we were going to have a huge uh, national shipbuilding boon when they won the referendum back in 2014. And what's happened to that? There's also no suggestion in the Tory motion about where they would find the money for this. We can only assume it's to come from, uh, or rather, they would rather spend money on tax cuts rather than providing direct services uh, for our ferries and our communities up and down the country. But the simple fact is, which was not acknowledged by the Conservative Party, is that the Scottish Government has a very proud record of supporting the communities that are dependent on ferries. We've heard that includes the building of new ferries. There's the Loch Sea Force, which has been mentioned, the Finlagen, uh, other vessels, eight vessels mentioned by the Minister. Uh, many areas of Scotland have also benefited from investment in our harbours and ports. And there seems no awareness amongst the Conservatives that many of the ports are not owned by Carmack or the Scottish Government. Investment for that requires to come uh, from the local authorities and other organisations. We should also be extremely proud of the huge investment by the Government in the ferries uh, themselves. And no doubt that record of investment and support shown by the Government is something that the Tories object to. They'd like to see it cut back. They'd like to see it privatised. They don't like the idea of a direct award. They would want to see where they can make savings from the ferry network rather than provide new investment. Uh, I recognise, of course, that the ongoing commitment to the Lifeline Ferry Services has been reflected in that £1.2 billion invested by the Scottish Government. I cannot re recollect a single budget amendment proposed by the Conservatives during the last 10 years in terms of ferries. Not one to say they wanted more investment. I can't even re recollect them raising the issue on a regular basis. I would say the Liberal Democrats have, perhaps not uh, Mike Russell, the wannabe member for Tory Central, but certainly Tavish Scott and Liam MacArthur have been regular, regular, um, regular proponents for the ferry services in their areas. And that's fair enough because their communities are reliant upon those services. Now, that's fair enough. And as was mentioned at the budget last year, it was a proposal or work done by those two members that helped to uh, get a, a further advance for people in the Northern Isles. The investment that's also been made has been uh, in terms of road equivalent tariffs to all ferry routes in the Clyde and Hebrides network. And the investment in the new vessels, uh, £41.8 million for the Loch Seaforth, two new £100 million dual fuel vessels at a cost of £106 million, the MV uh, Katrina at £12.3 million, there's also been substantial investment in harbour infrastructure in Ullapool, Stornoway, Brodick and Kerra, but none of that mentioned by the Conservatives when they had the chance uh, to raise that just now. So it's fairly clear to me that the Conservative Party, uh, of course they have questioned this. They forget, of course, that one of their transport ministers, Patrick McLaughlin, came to Scotland a few years back and said, the problem with your transport infrastructure in Scotland is there's not been investment for decades, forgetting that he himself was a transport minister in 1989. And that's what this government has had to do, is to pick up the mantle for the transport infrastructure, whether it's in terms of roads, whether it's in terms of ferries, or whether it's in terms of ferry infrastructure that previous governments have failed to do. So the government has done a good job. There is no question there's more to do because we all want to see improved services. Services. I would support the motion in Paul Wheelhouse's name. Jackie Bailey, followed by Alistair Allen. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to debate our ferry services, but in four short minutes, you'll forgive me if I simply cut to the chase. Um, there is a need for a Scotland-wide long-term ferry strategy covering all routes, not just the Clyde and Hebrides network, covering investment in harbours, investment in new ferries, and how we get the best from the money we spend. This was all identified by Audit Scotland in 2017, and the Scottish Government has yet to act on all of the recommendations. At a time of public funding constraints, though, spending on ferries has grown by 115% in real terms, but that's not been in infrastructure. Now, that's a huge amount of money, but passenger numbers are only growing by 0.3%. So this probably makes it the most subsidised form of public transport. So the Scottish Government do need to demonstrate value for money. But I absolutely accept that ferry services are essential for our island communities. 
Procurement of new ferries and the maintenance of existing ones is also an issue for attention. And I am disappointed that repairs and maintenance of our existing ferry fleet is carried out in Liverpool and not at the former Camel Laird Yard at Inch Green. The Scottish Government should aim to return maintenance and repair of the fleet to benefit local employment and our local economies. Let me turn to the two ferries being built at Ferguson's. Of course it is disappointing that there are delays, but I am clear that the design set out by CMAL was deficient in the first place. I have no problem with the Scottish Government providing Ferguson's with loans. I have no problem with support for shipbuilding. I think that is what we should be doing. But what frustrates me is that the Scottish Government recognise that CMAL is the problem, but instead of fixing it, they give Ferguson's loans. And unless they sort the problem out at source, the money will prove to be mere sticking plaster and we will be back here yet again. So the Scottish Government do need to sit down with CMAL and Ferguson's and get it sorted out. Then, of course, there is the Kilcreggan Ferry, presiding officer, the only ferry run by Strathclyde Partnership for Transport. Clyde Link provided the service between Kilcreggan and Gourock until May this year. It is fair to say that they made Para Handy look good. And for periods of time, the ferry was off more than it was on. And whilst Clyde Marine have subsequently taken it over, and the improvement in the ferry service is immense, it is still the community's aspiration that the service should be run by the Scottish Government. I am pleased that Paul Wheelhouse has affirmed the Government's commitment to doing exactly that. And finally, Presiding Officer, I can't talk about poor service with one aspect of public transport, ferries, without mentioning travel by rail as well. I think it is fair to say that in my area, rail travel is shockingly bad. It also affects commuters in East Kilbride, so I know it is of interest to the presiding officer. The problem has been evident for weeks, but for the last nine consecutive days, my constituents have endured cancelled and delayed trains. People have been late for work so many times. They are now in trouble with their employers. Students at university and colleges have missed lectures. Patients have missed hospital appointments. Children have been left stranded in childcare facilities because their parents can't get back to collect them. This applies to delayed ferries too. And all this at a time when prices have gone up. I used to complain about skip stopping. Now the new normal for trains in my area is to skip every stop by being canceled. And at a time when we needed, we needed this Scottish government to stand up for commuters and hold ScotRail to account, they weakened the targets and let them off the hook. The government must take urgent action to force ScotRail to improve their service. Presiding officer, whether it's ferries or trains, the Scottish Government need to provide a better service, better value for money. You know, we talk about the fourth no, industrial you must revolution. Close, please, Ms. Bailey. We talk about lunar tourism indeed. But for goodness sake, the train to Dumbarton is you still nowhere to be seen. Close. Alistair Allen, uh, followed by Edward Mountain. Presenting officer, living on an island, as in my case I do, I know what ferries mean to every aspect of any island's life and economy. And recognising that fact too, the Scottish Government has more than doubled what it spends annually on ferry services over the last decade. So let me put to one side just for a moment any doubts I may have about the Tories' motives today. As a party, they have seemed enthusiastic about privatising ferry services and suggested that the recent tender for ferry services was unfairly favouring the public sector, a sentiment I have to say uh, we heard echoes again of today. And uh, now, uh, or recently, they even seem to have uh, uh, been uh, um, almost opposing the, the Scottish Government's intervening to save the Scottish shipyards which are building new vessels. But let me, instead of doing any of that, uh, make some points today just briefly about some of the things about ferry services that have caused very genuine concern to my constituents in the course of 2018. I hope that the Minister uh, might be able to reflect on a few of them in his summing up. First was the situation uh, this Easter where for several days North Uist and Harris went without anything like a recognisable ferry service and that had real human and economic costs. I understand there may have been people who did not get to funerals. There were cancellations uh, in local hotels. Shops were beginning to struggle to get many supplies in. I think that CalMAC recognised that this was not their finest hour. 
And the episode certainly proved what happens if one, or certainly if has happened then, two larger vessels are out of action at a busy time. Now, the problem is, of course, partly born out of a big success story. In 2007, the SNP government began rolling out RET fares, making travel dramatically more affordable for islanders and tourists alike. And this has been a huge benefit to our economy and certainly to the, certainly, uh, to the community in which I live, with 10% of Hebridean jobs now thought to depend directly on tourism. But ferries in the Western Isles alone have now had to cope with an astonishing 184,000 additional passengers every year compared to a decade ago. Most routes now operate at capacity for six months of the year. Now, I would be doing a disservice, presiding officer, if I did not record what many of my constituents feel about that. And I can only ask members to imagine how the good people of Paisley or Motherwell might react if they were told that they regularly had to make uh, arrangements three weeks in advance whenever they wished to drive into Glasgow. There is no doubt that uh, in summer a second vessel is now needed on the Stornoway to Ullapool route and an extra sailing uh, day over the Sound of Harris to give but two examples. Crews do their utmost and as I've mentioned the funding is certainly there um, but I cannot say uh, with any certainty uh, that without improvements of this kind that uh, these and other routes will be able to cope next summer. I know that the government is giving thought to these difficult questions, thinking ahead in the longer term. Uh, there may uh, possibly uh, in time be uh, an argument for some of CalMAC's shorter routes uh, to be replaced by tunnels. That is an argument for another day and it's certainly not a cheap option. Uh, but I wish to say that no option is cheap when looked at over the long term. Presiding officer, the government has shown, as I say, its commitment in funding ferry services far beyond anything that has been funded by previous governments. And certainly, I should say, far beyond anything, or far beyond any uh, named sum committed to by the Conservative Party today. But there are problems with services. That is very obvious to all of us. Uh, and now it's time for all agencies to work together to reassure island communities about what shape this most vital of services will take in the future. We do not have forever to answer that question. Edward Mountain, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Officer, and before I start talking directly about ferries, I want to remind this government about the expectations that have been created by the Islands Bill that has been supported by this Parliament. They should be especially concerned, especially as this government has committed itself to island-proofing all their decisions. But in my mind, this government is failing short of those expectations by providing over a ferry wet network on the west of Scotland, which is responsible, as we've heard, for long construction de delays to flagship ferries, 10 years of underinvestment, no spare vessels in the fleet to cope with brake bands, and frankly, a ferries plan that I believe is gathering dust on a shelf and no one's looked at. This government, in my mind, is disempowering island communities who they sought to support just months ago with the island bills. And we are possibly seeing the worst of all outcomes, as Mr Green has made clear, where islanders are unable to travel on and off islands when they need to. There are people that have contacted me that are unable to travel either because they're disabled and the ferry isn't suitable or they can't get to it or indeed the problem is relating to overcrowding and they haven't been able to get to funerals. Let me be clear, this government has seen over 70,000, that's 70,000, cancel or delayed sailings since, since 2007. And we've now reached, as we've heard, the point where the managing director of CalMAC has called the widespread disruptions last April as the worst in eight years. That to me is a pretty damning indictment and just shows to me how far our ferry service has declined by the, under this government who've been in power for over 11 years. This is clear to me that the government must think through its ferry plans again to remedy the 10 years of mistakes it's already been made. Firstly, in my mind, and let me give you some help if I may, uh, on this, the SNP government must learn that bigger ships don't always lead to better services. Sometimes having smaller vessels that are built to serve multiple routes will build much needed resilience into the ferry network. I would take an intervention. 
Paul I'm Wheelhouse. I'm grateful to the, the convener of the committee for taking an intervention. Uh, I, I want to make the point that I think he would recognise from his own evidence session the point was made by uh, CMAL regarding the design of larger vessels that are much more fuel efficient. Uh, so I take on board the point he makes about the flexibility of smaller vessels, but would he recognise that there are positive arguments for larger vessels in terms of resilience in bad weather and also fuel efficiency? Edward Mountain. I think uh, I'd like to see those figures. I think that was evidence that we had. Well, no, sorry, I, I gave you the chance to answer. You must let me have the chance to answer you back. We must see that those vessels work. And just by saying it on paper that they're better doesn't mean that they're on the ground better. Volkswagen maybe give you some clues to that. Secondly, there needs to be a move towards standardization. And we need to have more standardized ferries more standardised docking stations, standardised training to allow crews and boats to serve the multiple routes. This will create the much needed flexibilities. Our ferry networks currently is, I'm sorry, I've taken one and I am pushed for time. I, I like to take one, but I can't do more. I believe it's time to learn the lessons of the past. The island class ferries, which served routes to Rasse, Mal and Aran, for example, were very versatile, readily interchangeable and could provide extra runs for commercial purposes. These are the design principles that the future CalMAC des fleet desperately needs. Thirdly, the SNP government must support different models of operating ferries. Now, I'm mindful of the time, presiding officer, and so I would say that finally, I believe that the Scottish government should also consider moving freight on the busiest route outside the hours of regular travel for islanders and island visitors. Six years ago, presiding officer, this government promised in its ferry plan to review their approach to ferry services and to continue to re reassess the needs of our island community. I believe, having heard the evidence that we have, that that plan has sat on the shelf, gathered dust, and nothing has happened to it. It needs to be dusted off and it needs to be looked at, especially because the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service is up for renewal in six years. Now is the time to take some action. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Kenneth Gibson. Dear presiding officer, I represent Arne and Cumbria and when ferry services let people down, it is right that we heed their concerns and push for realistic solutions. Since 2007, this government has dramatically increased investment in port infrastructure, vessels and services from 97.3 million in 2007-8 to 240.5 million this year, a 150% increase. A remarkable achievement after the neglect her fleet suffered under Labour and a 27.5% cut in capital available to the Scottish Government in the first year of the Tory Lib Dem UK coalition. Scottish Government investment was absolutely essential and its impact enormously positive. For example, passengers now enjoy more summer sailings following the extension of the two vessel service to Brodick from seven weeks each summer to nearly seven months, dramatically increasing capacity, visitor numbers and boosting Aran's economy by 10% in the year before last alone. Cumbria, 40 sailings a day in each direction in the summer, 20 in the winter. Last April, the new £31.2 million Brodick Ferry Terminal opened, completely transforming the harbour and providing 21st century facilities that will boost the island's economy. It is a new 110-metre two-berth pier designed to accommodate the new dual-fuel vessel MV Glen Sanox with a dedicated berth to serve other vessels, including cruise ships. A huge benefit for ferry users was the introduction of road-equivalent tariff for passengers, cars and coaches. Its rollout to Aran services in 2014, after I pressed the Clyde Islands to be included in the SNP's 2011 holiday manifesto, saw fares drop 46% for passengers travelling from Adrossan to Brodick and 64% for cars. RET has had a greater impact on Aran than any other island. Transport Scotland found that 11% of visitors questioned on the Adrossan to Brodick route and 17% on cloning to Lachranza said their journey had been wholly prompted by RET. Aran businesses are very positive about the impact, citing increases in both footfall and turnover. This boom has increased demand. I was therefore delighted to welcome the MV Katrina to Aran in 2016, having lobbied for the deployment of this £12.6 million hybrid vessel on the Clonig to, uh, to Lachranza sailing. MV Katrina is almost twice the size of the Loch Tarbot it replaced. It's also cleaner, more fuel efficient and more comfortable for passengers. Aran will also benefit from the £48.5 million new vessel MV Glen Sanox due to enter service this past summer. Now they say that a camel is a horse designed by a committee and so it seems with the Glen Sanox. Despite the fact it was agreed it would ply our busiest ferry route, Ardrossan to Brodick, it was apparently designed to fit all harbours except shockingly Ardrossan. As yet no one has been held accountable for this lamentable decision. With the Glen Sanox now expected to arrive a year behind schedule, islanders are understandably frustrated by this delay. The delivery of this vessel is essential to meet ever-growing demand. 
I'm delighted that Adrosian Harbour will shortly be upgraded to become a quality destination that supports growth through stronger links to Adrosian Town Centre. However, the question of the Arran Ferry Service potentially re relocating to Troon while these upgrades are carried out, which Calmac is arguing for behind the scenes, undermines the hard-fought Save Our Ferry campaign to, re to retain Adrosian as Arran's principal mainland air support. I trust the Minister will confirm today that Ardrossan will continue to serve the Ardrossan crossing during the refurbishment of Ardrossan Harbour to alleviate these concerns. Investment and improvement mean little if our ferry fleet is not resilient and islanders cannot rely on ferries to get them where they need to be. Together with Mike Russell, MSP, and representatives of Arne and Isla Community Councils, I met the Minister on 27 September to discuss this summer's network service disruption. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government must take ownership in relation to restoring reliability. If the ferry fleet is not maintained to an adequate standard and unable to find parts for repair maintenance in a reasonable time frame, a more effective response must be delivered for our island communities. I'm pleased the Government launched a £3.5 million ferries uh, resilience fund on a visit to Arne on 27th of August. This should help eliminate future disruption, but we can and must do more for our island communities. And I'm delighted that the Minister has confirmed his partition participation in the next Isle of Arran Ferry Committee on Monday 12th of November and look forward to welcoming him with a view to agreeing a plan of action to restore reliability in the short term as well as guaranteeing a much more resilient ferry fleet in the near future. We move to the closing speeches. Rhoda Grant, four minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I also pay tribute to the staff who provide lifeline ferry services, both those who work onshore and at sea those onshore often take the brunt of the Scottish Government's failures when ferries are delayed and cancelled. So they need our, our special thanks for dealing with that and indeed helping customers that are not getting to sail. Deciding officer, our ferries are not an end on, in themselves. Their purpose is to provide lifeline services. Our island communities and some of our peninsulas are totally dependent on ferry services. Without them, people could no longer live on these islands. And we don't have to go back very far in time to look at St Kilda where people were evacuated from their homes and their community because they could not access lifeline services. And that's not something that's desirable. It's essential that the Scottish Government act to make sure that the other communities do not face the same uh, situation and indeed that other communities do not face the chaos that, they, that the islands did uh, this summer. Uh, to highlight these issues, we would need a much longer debate, but if I could just maybe emphasise one or two. Firstly, can I turn to transparency? There needs to be a much more transparent approach to financing ferries. We've seen the controversy around the funding of the Loch Seaforth and its ownership um, after, seven, after the seven-year lease ends. What is the cost of the vessel? Surely it would have been much more cost effective to have, had, to have gone with the community's view and had a two ship solution. And this was highlighted by Colin Smith. Jackie Bailey talked about um, the, the dispute with Ferguson's over the Glen Sanox and the unnamed Hull 802 that will um, serve the Uig Triangle. What is the dispute? Is it really a deficient design? And if so, who is responsible for it? The money put aside for those two ships was £97 million and Ferguson's are now telling us it could well be double that. We need new ships to deal with demand. Um, demand has increased hugely. Jamie Green talked about this in his opening speech due to tourism and that's very much welcome. But we need the capacity to deal with it because locals themselves can't access ferries, they can't get to hospital, um, they miss funerals, as Edward Mountain said, um, they, don't, they aren't able to see their families. And I've suggested before that some ferry places be reserved at peak times for locals and then be released closer to the sailing time to deal with those local emergencies. I've also heard of stories where people have tried to book on a ferry that is full only to discover from friends who sailed on that uh, sailing that there was space on that boat and while locals do go on to stand by many of them can take that risk in emergency situations and choose to fly at a greater cost instead so we need to look at how we manage ferry bookings as well. Reliability has come up again and again and again in the debate this summer started um, with the issues with the Klansmen which put 
disruption on, on many of the routes for many months before the summer even had fully kicked in. Uh, we've had 2,326 cancellations in the beginning of the year from January to July. That is far too many. And um, I think it was Jamie Green who said 70,000 cancellations since the SNP took office. This is really not, not good enough for our island communities. And this goes on into the autumn. Alistair Allen talked about the issues with Euston and Harris more recently. There is no capacity in the fleet to deal with those issues. There is no additional ferry that can be brought in. We asked the Scottish Government and have been asking them for a number of years to look at an additional vessel, especially for the Alapo Lewis route over the summer. They told us they couldn't find Can one. Can you come to a close, My please? office Googled and found one within five minutes, but the Scottish Government couldn't negotiate the terms of the lease. Presiding officer, I just need to emphasise our islands deserve better. These are lifeline routes and people depend on them for their way of life. Paul Wheelhouse, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll try and respond as, as much as I can to points have been raised. Um, first of all, I suppose to, just to, I, I don't want to spend too much time responding to Jamie Green because I think uh, I've made my points clear about uh, the nature of his speech and the attack on the government. I would echo the points that were made by John Finney and, and others that uh, a bit of self-awareness in terms of the age of austerity we're currently living through which has been directed, whether he likes it or not, by the UK government. Uh, and I stand by the point that we believe there are real terms cuts to the Scottish government uh, budget, which has an implication for resources. But notwithstanding that, as Kenny Gibson has, has ably pointed out, we have increased spending on ferries in the face of that austerity. So I think a bit of self-awareness on the part of the Tories would be welcome. In terms of Colin Smith's response, I, I did want to intervene uh, to, to try and be constructive. And there's a lot that in, in what Colin Smith and indeed Jackie Bailey and Rhoda Grant are saying with, uh, in this debate that I can agree with. Uh, there, there are, we do have some issues around a 30-year uh, industrial strategy, so shipbuilding strategy, and it's, it's a, an idea I have sympathy with, but they're obviously, uh, in the context of year-to-year -year budgets, obviously having to be realistic about how we can plan for that. But looking at demand, looking at longer term, absolutely have sympathy with those points, and so hopefully we can find some common ground on these issues in the future. Uh, in terms of, um, I would say that uh, uh, Mr Smith, although there was much I agreed with, perhaps could have done more to maybe recognise the positive impact of RET in terms of the, this government's investment in RET rather than being entirely negative. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that, there is there's perhaps room for, for agreement with Labour in some aspects of what they're proposing. In terms of the Green Party, I, I'm disappointed that, that Mr Finney and his colleagues look likely not to support our, our amendment today. Uh, principally because there are specific references in our amendment to working with the trade unions in terms of the vessel replacement uh, programme and also uh, working with communities in these respects. Uh, by, by approving our amendment today, Parliament would uh, commit us to an action plan, but I clearly will want to take forward an action plan, which I should give credit to Mr Russell and Mr Gibson. If I briefly finish this point, Mr Russell and Mr Gibson, who uh, Mr Gibson and I elated, we, we met recently with representatives of Isla and, and Iron communities, and indeed out of that meeting and previous discussions, we've agreed to take forward action plans. So Mr Gibson takes some credit for those immediate actions, but Mr Finney wanted to... John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the Minister taking that intervention. Would the Minister acknowledge that I raised this issue some, some months ago with uh, Mr Youssef? And this is the first re reference back to me appears in paper form today. So I, of course, welcome the involvement of the trade unions in procurement, but that's the first mention back. It's very welcome. Paul Wheelhouse. I thank Mr Finney for his, uh, for his support in that respect. And I, I do recognise he's a long-standing interest in ferries issues, so I don't mean to diminish that in any way, shape or form. And I'm keen to work with Mr Finney and other colleagues across the chamber as we try and address the concerns about uh, ferry service, both in Clyde and Hebrides and, of course, where, if, if issues arise in the northern uh, services as well. Uh, Mr Finney was correct also to identify and, and right to do so that there had been a period, I think it was Ronald Robertson uh, of High Transit referenced the point there had been no major vessels commissioned between or entering service between 2001 and 2011 in his evidence to committee. Of course, there were some minor vessels that were commissioned through that period, but major vessels are obviously very significant to resilience in the network. I do suspect the Green Party and the Conservative Party do not agree on the overall strategy for ferries going forward. Uh, I hope uh, Mr. Mr Finney, if he doesn't support us today, can find his, in his heart to support us as we go forward. But in terms of uh, Mike Rumble's uh, points around uh, ferry services and Northern Isle services, I, I apologise I didn't get a chance to take an intervention from Mr Scott. 
uh, but happy to engage with Mr. Scott hereafter. I would just say in response to Mr. Rumbles that we have recently started the procurement of the Northern Isles ferry service uh, contracts. Uh, as part of that, Transport Scotland officials are actively engaging with local stakeholders, including the trade unions, uh, local community representatives, uh, on future service specification. That will look to try and build in sufficient flexibility to vary the contract in response to current and future demands. So I hope that uh, offers some hope to Mr Rumbles that we're heading in the right direction there. Uh, Jamie Halker Johnston started well. Uh, I agreed with much of what he said in the first part of his speech. I'm afraid he lost me about halfway through uh, when he started to uh, change tack. Um, we are, uh, just to make the point, which I'm trying to intervene about uh, road equivalent tariff, we are prevented at this moment in time implementing road equivalent tariff in the Northern Isles because there has been a challenge to the European Commission on a state aid case by a private operator on the Pentland services. So we are unable to implement. So I think he's, he probably knows that, and, and perhaps it's unfair of him to, to accuse us of withholding RET from the Northern Isles because he knows we cannot do that while there's a, a state aid complaint being made by, a, by another operator. And we have to respect that process and wait the outcome of that. Uh, I think I'm short of time, presiding officer, so I will end it there. But I have been listening carefully to all the points being made by members across the debate. I maintain the point I'm making the, the, the amendment that I want to work with those across the chamber and look forward to doing so, presiding officer. Call Donald Cameron to close the debate for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I um, belatedly, belatedly, on behalf of these benches, welcome Mr. Wheelhouse to his role as Ferries Minister in his first debate on Ferries. I'm not sure how he's feeling about that after this debate. But while many of the problems may not have occurred on his watch, that does not, in my view, absolve his government uh, and his party. Now, I welcome the opportunity to close this debate, not least because alongside digital connectivity, which we debated yesterday, if there is one issue that exercises any MSP for the Highlands and Islands, then it is transport and ferries in particular. And since my election to this Parliament, the issue of ferry services has dominated my mailbox. And it's a sorry saga of delays, cancellations and insufficient capacity of one island community sometimes pitted against another on account of the best boats being shunted around the network. And let's pause and remind ourselves, as others have done, what that means for our constituents in their everyday lives. People sometimes simply unable to get to work, people unable to get to important hospital appointments, people unable to run their businesses effectively. This is the harsh reality, and given the immense importance in connecting people from the islands to the mainland and in enabling tourism, it is axiomatic that a reliable and robust ferry network is critical in delivering economic prosperity to some of our most fragile areas. However, as we have heard today from members across the chamber, this government's stewardship of Scotland's ferry network has been, in my view, shambolic. Jamie Green noted that since the SNP came to power in 2007, more than 70,000 ferry services have been either cancelled or delayed. To put that in context, in the near 12 years that the SNP have been in power, that equates to over 120 delayed or cancelled sailings a week. That is unacceptable, presiding officer. Now, I know ScotRail doesn't have its problems to seek, but we would not accept that kind of performance on our rail network. And, of course, there are next to no alternatives when it comes to a cancelled ferry. Ministers have long been aware of these problems. Back in 2010, CalMac, in their submission to that year's ferry review, stated to the government that a new ferry would have to be built every year just to stand still. Audit Scotland have noted it too, but for the SNP, it's not considered a priority. A few months ago, I asked when the Scottish Government's own expert ferry group, uh, who were supposed to meet up to three times a year, last met. The answer when it came was that it turned out the group hasn't met at all since last December, almost a year ago. And nothing could typify this Government's approach to ferries. They are always, always a problem for another day. Yes, briefly. Yeah. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be very brief. I would just uh, ask Mr Cameron to reflect the fact that in, in response we suggest we are establishing another meeting of the ferry group and we also have 20 other groups that we meet with to discuss ferry operations. Donald Cameron. I'm glad to hear it but it still reflects that ferries as I've said are a problem for another day they're not a priority. Now of those 70,000 journeys that I mentioned the vast majority have affected the Highlands and Islands. In Oban there have been more than 10,000 cancellations or delays to the services that operate from there. From Stornoway to Ullapool 3,400. From Rothsey to Weems Bay, more than 7,000. And that last route, in fact, provides a good example of how costly disruption can be. Because when the Rest and Be Thankful Pass was closed a few weeks ago, the only practical way that farmers on Butte could transport livestock 
on HGV lorries was to Weems Bay, but that terminal was closed. The solution, a diversion to Guruk, but Guruk cannot land HGV lorries. Result, Butte's farmers were prevented from transporting livestock. Or I could point to residents in Danoon who are exasperated about the future of the Danoon to Guruk ferry route. And I know they're having their AGM next week, and I know the government has been invited to attend that, and I hope they do, because they want a fair tender process resulting in a robust and reliable ferry service on that route. Now, I readily, readily acknowledge, presiding officer, that you cannot eliminate ferry cancellations and delays in their entirety. We face some of the harshest weather, and ultimately, passenger safety must come first. But not all these delays and cancellations have been due to weather, and many could have been prevented. And on numerous occasions, and we've heard it across the chamber, we hear about vessels breaking down, and then consequent delays and cancellations following suit. For example, the recent breakdown of the MV Hebrides in September. And we all know this is because Satcalmac do not have enough backup vessels to deal with breakdowns. The aging fleet adds further problems into the mix. And as Audit Scotland noted, vessel maintenance costs increased by 136% due to a larger and increasingly older fleet. And others have spoken about the fact there is inflexibility in our ferry fleet, where some boats cannot learn, land in certain ports. Now, briefly, some of the other points that have been made across the chamber. Um, Jamie Halcrow Johnson referred to, to the Northern Isles uh, and the issues there, and Edward Mountain and Rhoda Grant spoke of many personal stories of individuals um, who, who, who have trouble with travelling on, on ferries. John Finney spoke about um, the cost to the taxpayer uh, of the Stornoway Ullapool boat. Um, but most importantly, Kenny Gibson, and I rarely quote Kenny Gibson with approval in this chamber, but he said the Scottish Government must take ownership. Well, hear, hear to that. Yes, indeed, they must take ownership. We want to stand up for the many local communities who rely on ferry services. They're not just a mode of transport. They are a lifeline. And that word has been overused, but it is, remains important. A lifeline. It shouldn't need to be mentioned in a motion. It's a fact. They are intrinsic to the people of our islands, to their lives, to their well-being, and to their existence. And the SNP government has presided over a decade of failure, and there is little evidence they are either willing to acknowledge that or work to improve it. Because if they fail to act, they will be letting down communities across the west and north of Scotland, and we will not let that stand. We will fight for those communities, and we will fight for the future of our ferry network. Thank you, President. Yeah. President. That concludes the debate on concern over the state of Scotland's ferry services, and we'll move on to the next item of business. If you could do so quickly, please.